Hello again, welcome to another edition of Arts and Ideas. I'm Sue Swinand. And today we're over at the Worcester Art Museum and we're talking with a very remarkable artist, James Dye, who uh, is working almost exclusively in pen and ink right now. Uh, he has a solo show here called the uh, Exploring the Myths of James Dye. And it's a fascinating show that's going to be here all summer through September 2nd. So uh, you'll have lots of opportunities to come back again and again, because you have to spend a long time looking at these. But uh, James, I want to thank you for this wonderful work. I, I know you spent probably thousands of hours in concentrated effort. But yeah, I probably lost count at some point, yeah. <laughs> and thank you for coming in and telling us all about it thank today. Thank you for having me. Um, I think first we should start off by just finding out a little bit about you. So could you uh, give us a little bit of your background? Uh, okay. Um, I was born in Holden, Massachusetts, and so I grew up in the area. And I attended Art Institute of Boston at Lesley University in Boston, Massachusetts. And I really focused in printmaking in school, uh -huh. so etching. And, uh, and then when I got out of school, I didn't have a press anymore. I moved back to Worcester. And I moved to Dip Pen and India Ink because it was the best way I could really keep that direct line quality from etching. Yes, I can see how the etching yeah. would translate yeah. right into using the dip pen, mm -hmm. the same line uh, work. So I sort of draw, I guess, like a printmaker a little bit with the, the, the blacks and the, the direct line and everything. So, and then I sort of just uh, kept going with that and evolved the process. And you know, here we are, really. Did you meet uh, Katie at? Uh, yes, I met, at, I met my wife, and uh, she went to Mass Art, and I went to Art Institute of Boston. We had a mutual friend. And uh, his wife is a terrific artist. Yes. She works in glass. And I'm still longing for her to have one of her pieces. Well, I have. She has the. She has the studio in the basement where they're killing everything, and I have the studio upstairs in our house. So you have the studio in the home. Yes, which is... and then you know we very rarely see each other when we're both working. We'll meet in the kitchen sometime. Well, it's nice that you have that support. That you have someone who really uh, appreciates what you're well, yeah, doing. She's been huge through this whole yeah. process because this is this took me so long and. Uh, I probably wasn't the easiest person to live with all the time, so she's been tell, enormously helpful. Tell us a little bit about this show, this, uh, this uh, Exploring the Myths of James Dye. So I have 20 pieces here um, over the past several years they've been created. Several of them just for this show, and some of them have been shown previously. Uh, and you were saying each piece takes about three months. Well, I mean, it depends <laughs> on the size. This piece, uh, I think by a by maybe like a centimeter. This is my largest piece. Uh, and this one took me about three and a half months, I would say, wow. to do the whole wow. thing. And I would then, go cross-eyed. Do you use a magnifying glass? Uh, not yet. <laughs> Sooner or later, my I'm, I'm going to end up in glasses, yeah. I'm sure. But sure. I, have to, uh, I have to take breaks sometimes, especially. Look away. Look well, away I mean, and I'll be drawing. It's sort of like uh, if you get tired enough and you're working on something like this, it's almost like drunk driving, where you know it's, it's sooner or later you're going to make mistakes, so yes, it's time to put it, it down. Yes, it is. It's yeah. true. Wow. Well, uh, the show is you worked with uh, Nancy, mm -hmm. uh, um, Nancy Burns, Nancy Burns, and, and Rachel Kane, and Rachel Kane. Yeah. They did a fabulous job. It's so beautifully put together. Are you pleased? I'm sure you must oh, be. Very much. I, yeah. uh, it's you know I don't really know much about the. It looks it, great. Curating the show. And, so, and yeah. everything, she's 
tell about how she's used the, old, the works from the old collection. Well, so uh, both of them were great at sort of guiding me through this whole process. And the, we decided, because I had a background in printmaking, that we were going to use uh, prints from the museum's collection to, uh, to pair with my work to sort of show not only just the visual uh, connection, but also we picked a lot of mythological images because I'm very inspired by myth and narrative and story to sort of pair with my work. So I got to go back and look at the museum print uh, archives, which Listen, are fabulous, massive. Fabulous. It was incredible. I'm holding, you know, like, you know, looking at William Blake and everything, and, you know, it's like meeting your heroes. So here he so. is <laughs> hanging next to Goya. Yeah, and Goya, hanging we ne had Colo over there, we got uh, Blake, and, you know, it's pretty. William Blake, awesome. It's, it was actually when Nancy originally told me that, you know, this is who I was going to be hanging with, it was kind of intimidating to tell you the truth. You hold your own. <laughs> I look at them and That's I say, nice I love this. Yeah, if, if I could take one home, I'd probably take yours. Well, I love you. it so thank much. You. Well, the show is great. And uh, it's, speaking about mythology, you, you must be a literary guy. I mean, do you, um, yes. uh, what do you read? What, how do you know all this stuff? So uh, I grew up in a house with a bookcase in every room. My parents were English majors. and. Uh, you know, they read me uh, all sorts of myths, uh, you know, Greek, Norse, Nazi stories, uh, Aztec, we, you know, and obviously read like The Lord of the Rings and basically anything, you know, my, my dad's always reading Paradise Lost, you know, and you know, my mom's, you know. Like, you know all these literary references yes. show up in your work. So uh, I sort of just grew up in a house with uh, a lot of not just, you know, literature is paramount, but also, but also like a lot of mythology. So and, sea yeah. monsters were big and, yeah, and <laughs> it's demons. All, it's, uh, it all comes from, you know, yeah, just, you know, of, uh, you know, heaven, hell, the whole, the whole cosmos. Every culture yeah, has those table. myths that explain it all. And, uh, yeah, that's, uh, that's really one of the focuses of my work is sort of the idea that there's sort of this underlying communal structure of myth that's shared through uh, all cultures, so you know, sort of like the shared ancestry, and we've evolved these stories, and they, yeah. the details have changed over time, but the basic structure is still. Or the image is slightly different, but it's still an archetypal right. symbol. Yeah. So I mean, these are all my own sort of creations, yes. but they're sort of built on that shared but foundation. But that's what's so funny about yeah. them, you know, is that they're not like they're sort of funny, and uh, different, and. It's kind of like a postmodern thing almost, you know? Well, the idea yeah. is everyone's going to come to it and they're going to see something that they're going to identify with without necessarily knowing why they identify yeah. with it. It's going to be their entry point into the work and then they can sort of make their own story from what's there. And you're actually doing writing too, right? Yes, I do. I write. What I've kind of... Uh, I, uh, short stories, fiction. You know, uh, is it sort of uh, humorous or serious? I guess it's surrealist. I guess one would say. I usually have a little bit of humor in it. But yeah, it's, you it, know, he's it, got I, a I, great I, sense of humor. If you look at these things, it's a laugh a minute. Yes, <laughs> I mean it's you know there's some weighty stuff and then some yes. humorous stuff. That's what I love about yeah, it. So. You can look at it at many different levels. Yeah. So how did this show come about? Um, so I was lucky enough, uh, well, I, I joined Arts Worcester, and that was probably the best decision I ever made in my life. Yes, indeed. <laughs> and uh, found out there's a whole community of artists in Worcester who have been very supportive and helpful to me, and I was lucky enough to uh, win the Arts Worcester Biennial, and the uh, reward was show at museum. The museum's That's been very quite welcoming a prize. To me and, Thank yeah. you, Worcester Art Museum. What yes. a great prize and, and what an encouragement to the community of artists. Yeah. Uh, he, he not only has he won the Worcester uh, Biennial Arts Worcester Biennial Best in Show Prize, but he's had prizes at the Fitchburg Art Museum Annual. He's this. He's been on fire for the last few years. You got the. Uh, you got a Worcester uh, well, Foundation. Arts Council grant. Arts Council. Yeah. And also the biggie is the uh, is Mass a Cultural. Final, a finalist. Yes. Finalist the, in the Mass Cultural Council. Yes. So you are on a roll, guy. I mean, yeah. whoo. I hope it. You know. Hope it keeps rolling. <laughs> Let's take a look at the one that won the uh, biennial prize. Sure. So this is the piece that James won the Best in Show Award from Arts Worcester with. 
What, what's the title of this one, James? This is Temple of the Burdened Host. And how did that, how did that title come about? Uh, well, the, uh, so I title last. Sometimes I sort of have a general idea where it's going, but the title is sort of the icing on the cake for me. What does this look like? I yeah. guess it's the temple of the burden host. Right, because I, uh, you know, host being like, host is in, you know, like heavenly host or like, you know, the congregation, but also host is in like, you know, the host, the person. I was thinking of this guy being the host. Well, I mean, you can look at him, or you can see this is all the host, and there's a lot of burdens here, which is the point. These. All of these uh, small characters are lifting a weight. He's holding the scales oh, you in know the what? center. I didn't even make that yeah. connection. You the, see? The crab at the bottom is supporting the And it's like here. Hercules. Yes. So again, of... there are many myths which have somebody holding up the world or well, holding it wasn't up. Hercules, it was Atlas that oh, held up the world. Sorry, sorry. And, and he didn't hold up the world, he held up the heavens. That's a common mistake. <laughs> um, but yeah, so there's there's a lot of uh, references to uh, to wait in this one, yeah. it ended up being, as you can see, like the elephants. And again, it's yeah. a metaphor for life, bearing your burden, holding the, sure. holding it together, sure, doing the hard work. I like it as sort of like a, I mean, it's sort of a cosmology thing by the end of it. I sort of look at this one as sort of a map of the universe. You have the subterranean, you have the sort of the heavens, and all these characters along the way. Here's sort of the supplicants rising up the temple on either side. Fabulous. You know, I also love the way you use the borders. And uh, the other thing that kills me about these is they're all bilateral symmetry. They're well, so perfectly designed. A lot of the newer ones uh, are. If you go back through the show, you'll find some that are a little uh, looser. But there was yeah. a point when I started doing a lot of the symmetry. And now I'm sort of, you know, take, I'm sort of dialing it back in some ways too. So I got to find, you know, you, you get interested in doing one setup and then you kind of switch yeah. to another. So. Well, it gives it a certain uh, archaic look yes, and it's... a formality. But the cool thing about it is, even though it's perfectly balanced symmetry, when you look closely, the bird is on one corner and this little Pig. Piggy leg over here. I'm the, he's on another corner. Mm -hmm. But every little creature is different. There are no two creatures alike, which it just boggles my mind yeah, how the, you do this. It's the fun part coming up with them. And so. every little one of the supplicants is yes. different. <laughs> can you imagine doing all those tiny little drawings? Yep. Oh my yes, goodness. I can. <laughs> <laughs> so, what about this part, the black part? Oh, black. So that's, um, so that's usually done with a, a matte India ink because you get the, the India ink kind of has a shellac in it. Yeah. So it, it we'll give little, a little, little shine. Yeah. So when I'm doing the lines, I use a, a standard India ink and it sort of has that raised quality to it also in the shine. A little body. Yeah. And um, then I do the, the matte black in the background in several layers. You do that with a brush? Yeah, I do that with a brush. And uh, so I usually go around the edges with a pen and sort of feather it out and then I go in with the blacks. And then usually I lay them in before I do most of the details. So I sort of get the large notes of the uh, pieces that are going to be touching the black. And then I lay the black in and then I go in with the detail afterwards. Wow, wow. Can you imagine, think about it, you can't have the little pen line cross over the edge or it's a mistake. You, and you can't, lot of stress. you can't erase <laughs> ink. You can't erase ink on paper. We better move to another one because I want to look at this one for an hour. And okay. I know we, got, we want to show the audience a few more. This one really reminds me of some kind of ancient knowledge. Uh, <laughs> yeah, well, this one's called Arcanum, so you're correct. <laughs> it is all uh, this, so I rarely make direct references it's all very general but uh this one actually is all about it's various defunct uh scientific ideas and natural philosophy and alchemy and various various ideas about the setup of the world and uh the universe and so you can see this is the ptolemic model of the universe in the top was uh the earth at the center and here we have here we have atlas holding up the heavens 
And uh, this is phrenology, studying the bumps on the head. Yes, I didn't know that. Zodiac symbols here, uh, flat earth theory, hollow earth theory. This is, there's this book called The Mundus Subterraneus by this uh, 17th century uh, German philosopher. I and, think I've heard of that. Yes, uh, yeah. Antonasius Kircher. And he had this idea of the way the fires beneath the earth connected. And he wasn't really that far off. He thought volcanoes were the vents, so he's pretty good. And here you have uh, Anubis uh, weighing the heart versus the feather in the afterlife. And this is preformation, which is the idea that we are all a little fully formed homunculi inside every sperm. Homunculi. Yeah. Yep. And then um, these are the humors around the edges. Wow. And the way you, uh, the way you control the humors is through bloodletting. So here's the. There's the, There's the leeches. There's the leeches. Yeah. So at some point, science. these were all. Some point, these were all uh, accepted ideas that this is the way the world works. This is science, and um, well, it was the yeah. beginnings. Yeah. It was the well, that's why I like natural philosophy, and I feel like, um, and you know, uh, alchemy and these kind of ideas, because they're these bridges between sort of the supernatural world and, yeah. and we were starting to accept more rational thought. And, and really revelations and insights of the thinkers of that time. But they still weave it together. Like they, they, they're using observation and coming up with, uh, they're coming up with theories based on what they see. But at a certain point, certain point they still just Don't use their know. imagination. <laughs> You know, it's you go down as far as you can see into the volcano, and where you can't see, well, that's where the dragons and are. And you have to make yeah. that crap up. <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, it's they, yeah, it's it's because yeah, they, they're also they We're don't want to. We're still doing it. They also yeah, they also don't want to. At the time, they want to understand the world, but they also can't really dispel uh, their know, religious their beliefs. religious ideas. So exactly. they have to sort of combine the two yes. and find the find That's a, the beauty yeah. of it. That's the beauty of it. Well, the other thing I love is that those kinds of uh, creation myths and theories, they go from culture to culture. Everybody has them, and so many times the elements are similar. Oh, very much so. Very There's similar. often the, that single first uh, sort of chaotic deity or creature at Who the beginning. Who came out of the footprint of the... Or just, yeah, yeah, yeah. Of, you know, came out of nowhere, and then the... Descendants of that, or the the second the second uh, god destroys that and uses it to make the universe, yeah. and that's that's a repeated or idea. Or even the worship of the sun and the and right. the cycles. I know your work has a lot to do with cyclical life and death. As right, well. that's the the Ouroboros, the the snake biting yeah. its tail. That's eternity. Oh. Right Let's there. look at the Ouroboros. I, okay, did sure. you say Ouroboros? Ouroboros. Or? Yes. Okay. Let's look at that. That's a great one. Now this one has an image I'm familiar with, the uh, snake eating its own tail. Mm -hmm. uh, that yeah. one goes in every culture. What's yes. that? So that's the, that's the Ouroboros, and uh, in various forms it appears in almost every culture. Uh, you see it a lot in my work, snake eating its own tail, dragon eating its own tail, you know, wolf eating its own tail, whatever, anything that's sort of devouring itself. And it's, Often a and symbol, creating itself. It creating itself at the same time. Sometimes it's seen as that was the first thing, that was the first thing that existed Creature. in the universe because it was the simplest idea. Uh, it's also seen as a symbol for eternity, for creation and destruction. It's, you know, it's a, it's a recurring idea of the cyclical nature of existence. It's so, a fabulous symbol. It's wonderful. And it's, also, it's one we all, it resonates with all of us. Like it's something, for some it. reason, it's we not... all really feel connected to that sure. symbol. Because we eat, we die, we re are reborn. Right. You've, you've got the Ouroboros going many times here. Yeah, so this is, uh, this is map of the solar system. You have the sun at the center, and then each planet has a different, uh, a different entity uh, devouring itself, uh, representing the orbit of the planet. I did include Pluto because I never gave up on it, no matter what anybody says. <laughs> so, uh, yeah. So this is uh, this and um, the Hanging Tree are probably the earliest pieces in the show, actually. So. I'm just laughing at these little details at the bottom. I just noticed they're all little gears. Well, so this is uh, it's called Musica Universalis, which is based on the idea. It's the music of the spheres. Yeah. Which is this old idea that every uh, Every body in the heavens has its own 
sound, its vibration. own vibration, its own musical note that we can't hear because we are, you know, but, there's but a small harmony. creatures. But if we could only elevate ourselves, we could hear the music in the universe. But there's a harmony. So the gears sort of all comes to the idea of like the structured universe, that it's all this perfectly turning, ordered machine. A well-oiled yes. machine, as uh, Newton would have said. There you go. <laughs> Oh, I, I love this one so much. Um, let's look also at one more because okay. we, uh, what's the one with the hanging tree? Oh, I hanging see, tree. Sure. I want to see that one. Okay. What a wonderful relationship between these uh, old prints and your work. The connections are wonderful. Now, this one is called? This one's called the hanging tree. And uh, we sort of, we paired it with the Kello uh, hanging prints and these, uh, these images of, uh, of death. And it's, it's the, you know, this is sort of the cycle. We talk about some of the creation stuff and this is the, you know, the end here. And, you know, this is the, the hanging tree and there have been, unfortunately, many hanging trees through history and it's sort of an iconic image. And this one was really about the idea of uh, that sort of, N that much negative, uh, you know, that many terrible events happening in one place, how it sort of infects the place, and the place takes on this, uh, it becomes this sort of, it's the bridge between life and death, the idea of the tree, you know, and the tree is this living entity that we've then used as this uh, uh, instrument of execution. So it's life and death and all the there all at once. And the dystopia of a society going amok. Yes, it's also, I mean, it's, it's, it's the whole spectacle and, of yeah, death, which yeah, is yeah, yeah, yeah. very disturbing into itself. You know, I always loved the uh, image of the tree, the symbol. Mm -hmm. And the American Indians, everybody had it. Mm -hmm. But the idea that it reaches up to the heavens but it also, and it reaches down with the same structure. Well, that's the, amazing. Uh, there's the idea of the axis mundi, which is yeah. the, uh, the pillar that connects heaven and earth and that's sort of what the tree is here and it's so this is sort of this is you know death carried into the underworld through the tree you know and yet the tree takes its life right. from the dead mm -hmm. exactly. from in the it's earth the cycle. It's the Ouroboros. and then it gives the fruit which right. feeds the life which feeds the roots which and right. so forth right so mercy, how do you get all the middle tone? I know the audience probably has no idea. But. So uh, again, I'm using uh, dip pen. So all dip pen is is a little metal nib and just a pen holder. So, you, so the old kind that they used to use in the in the old days, where yes, you dip a, a little. Yes, it's a point. very it's an antique way of uh, of drawing. And all, again, it's just you dip it in the ink, and the ink runs out the pen, and then you got to dip it again, and you just keep going. And so to get grays. Uh, this is all just dots, just very, very tight dots. It's a very small nib, and it takes. So just doing, laying in this gray, uh, took me. I mean, I, I would, I can't remember, but it must have been at least a week of just making. So dots. the point is, the closer the dots are together, the darker the color mm -hmm. comes. And the beautiful thing about that is, a machine wouldn't do it like that. But the subtle nuances of tone give it presence. It, it feels like there's a wall that, you know, something solid there. Or uh, even now, so what about all the patterns too? He has to decide that that horn is going to be one value darker or mm -hmm. one value lighter or, wow. I sort of, I sketch in, I call them the major notes in the beginning with, with pencil. I sort of break up where the piece is going to be. So you draw in the basic structure. Yes, the basic, but uh, again, a lot of it's, some of it's sort of intuitive later, but I, I have to, I know the structure of the piece, so I know where I'm, what areas I'm working in and what areas are going to be gray or uh, black or white or what areas are going to have a lot of uh, pattern in them, but I'm not sure what the pattern is yet, but I still need to section them off from everything else. So I know that there's going to be black in here, so I have to sketch in these areas without the black, put in the black, and then go in with the texture and the gray So afterwards. everywhere where there's the teeny tiniest little white dot, he has to draw the darks around the white dots. Yes. You realize there's no white use here. <laughs> right, there's, right. I was trying to tell him he could get a white pen to fix it. <laughs> but anyway, they're, they're just mind boggling. Uh, I love the symbols too. Tell us just a little bit more about like 
did you notice the border? Every single little square is different. The fire, the hanging noose, the gears, all symbols, mm -hmm. all wonderful symbols. I mean, some of them, again, it's, uh, they're very just elemental symbols. Like I have, there's clocks around it just because time and time, I mean, that's the, that's the inescapable force. That's the march of, you know, eternity coming at us, which, which eventually- Which only exists in our mind, of right. course. Right, but eventually, <laughs> you know, death, this, I mean, these pieces are all about that no matter what station you are in life, death eventually will come for you no matter what you do. Just yeah. like time will come yeah. for us all. So. I love the way the roots and the leaves are, or the branches are also like flow. They just have that ongoing growth and flow mm -hmm. that is life. It's, yeah. They're wonderful. So uh, what else? Uh, you, you're, you've been working on this show for a whole year now and mm -hmm. this is like and it'll your be total up focus. it'll September 2nd and uh, yeah. So. Right in downtown Worcester. It's a great show. I hope you'll come over and see it. And uh, we, we also, he has a terrific website. And also, I found a lot of other sites which were very interesting, too. Like you were telling about your studio. He, it was so beautiful reading it. He was talking about um, when you go in the studio. Yeah, and I lock myself away inside the studio. And, he says uh, when he closes the door, he goes into another world. Yeah, I have to. I'm going to be there for a long time, so I spend a lot of time in that room. I often see the sun come up through these. I keep uh, light block curtains up except for one little porthole out into the world. So he has sunrise. one little window that looks out into the woods, and that's his portal. Yes. I love that. So you transport yourself into another world. Cutting off distractions. This yep. is my little yep. fantasy world I'm living in. But you in. can find a lot about him on uh, online if you go uh, and look up James Dye. JamesDye.org is my website. I'm working on another one, but I'm not the most tech savvy person. So okay. Give me time. <laughs> Well, I just, there's, it's just been wonderful. Um, I love the one with the whale and the, the way you distort things to get more meaning and more interest. It's, they're, they're just fabulous. Oh, I hope you can spend a lot of time looking at them. That's the idea. So. Okay. Well, thanks again for joining us. And uh, I hope we see you again for another edition of Arts and Ideas.